title would indicate I'm going to talk about collections and, uh, and foreclosures um, Friday afternoon at 2 o'clock. There's probably not many more dry topics than you can come up with than collections and foreclosures. I didn't even try to spice it up, but uh, try to add some flavor to it as we go along. Uh, obviously, there's been lots of press over the last uh, three or four years in terms of foreclosures and the financial crisis, and mortgage lending, and Fannie Mae uh, going down, and everything else that's uh, went along with that, so you can't hardly uh, open up the newspaper without reading about foreclosures. But it's interesting, in order to prepare for this, I, I looked at some materials that I had in my office uh, uh, for a number of years and came across a uh, CLA presentation that, uh, that our now bankruptcy clerk, Greg Entwistle, did when he was at the Woods firm. It was from April of 2000, uh, and I looked through it, and quite frankly, a lot of the stuff that Rick talked about then is really the same as it is now. The law of foreclosures in South Dakota has really not changed. Uh, it, may, it may be more used uh, in the last few years than it's, than it's been in the past, but the, but the law is really pretty consistent. Um, those of you that, that, that know me, I am primarily a creditor's rights lawyer. Uh, that's most of what I do. I will attempt to uh, weave in some, some debtor's options and some debtor's strategies uh, as we go along, but if there's a, if there's a bias there, that, that would be where it is. Uh, I'm not going to try to hide that. Um, just to, uh, by way of overview, I'm going to start out talking a little bit about some of the collections type matters. Uh, I'm not going to spend much time on that and then spend most of my time on uh, foreclosures, including the, the description of the pre foreclosure stuff and then the, uh, the general process. So, further ado, uh, just a, a general topic of collections see how do you perceive? Have your demand, your summons and complaints, your judgment, and then post judgment uh, efforts. Uh, starting off with the demand letter, obviously in South Dakota there is no requirement that you send a demand letter. If there's a collection action uh, that needs to be pursued, you do not have to send out a demand letter saying we're going to see you in the next number of days. There's no, no such requirement that I'm aware of. Um, there is a different, there are requirements when we get to the foreclosure uh, section, and we'll talk about that, but here I'm just talking about general, general collections. Um, obviously, when you do a demand letter, you have to think about the Fair Debt Collection Practice Act, as, uh, as Tom alluded to in his presentation. Uh, and you need to be careful to follow the requirements there. I haven't focused on or spent a lot of time on that in terms of this presentation. Instead, I'm going to uh, focus on just a few issues that, that uh, I've seen of late that have come up in South Dakota in collection uh, practice. Um, first one of these uh, would relate to the military service verification. I'm sure most of you have seen uh, the standard affidavits of default that are sent by the creditor's lawyer when the uh, time for answer has expired, the 30 days have expired, and the creditor is seeking default judgment. Um, there's always been that standard line in there that says that uh, you don't think that the debtor, you don't have information to believe at least that the debtor is a member of the Armed Forces of the United States of America. I haven't given much thought to that language. It's been in there since I started practicing. Uh, but it actually comes from the Service Members Civil Relief Act, and I've provided the site there. And if you read down in there, what it does require is it says that uh, if the plaintiff is unable to determine whether or not the defendant is in the military service, uh, the affidavit needs to state that the plaintiff is unable to determine uh, and what they've done to uh, the efforts they've taken to, to verify that. Well, there have been some, uh, some state court judges in South Dakota, including one of my former partners, who have taken that over and said that the standard language just says if you're not aware of them being in the military service is insufficient. So instead, uh, you, you need to demonstrate in your affidavit, uh, at least for that judge, what steps you've taken to uh, search it out. Um, thankfully, the Armed Forces have uh, set up a website where you can go to and look to see if uh, a particular debtor is in the Armed Forces. And for whatever reason, this, this link that I copied here, uh, it worked when I went to it, then I tried to type it in just uh, straight the other day to verify it, and it didn't work. If you just go to Google and type in service member search, it will get you to this same site, and it does work. Here's a problem with it, though. In order to utilize the search, you have to have either the debtor's birthday or their social security number. If you're working as a creditor for a bank, that's, you're probably going to have those. Uh, if you're doing a general collection action, like Tom Collector and Mr. Ashby's example, you might not have that information. Uh, I'm not sure what you would do in that instance to, to satisfy the requirement, though I think you could put things in your affidavit, like we found him in uh, Colton, South Dakota, uh, working on his farm. That's probably pretty good evidence that he's not in the military. So when, the, when you served him, you could put that in your affidavit to add those types of things, and I, I think you're going to get by uh, 
the requirements with that type of a, a state. Second, uh, just a passing note, there is a new uh, default action cover sheet in the Second Circuit. Those of you that practice uh, here know that when you send the default papers down to the judge, they want to have a, a cover sheet. Just go to the Second Circuit's website, pull that off, and, and complete it when you send it in. There are some other requirements, I think, like up in Watertown and Coddington County, they require a docketing sheet when you send your uh, materials in. But just to keep that in mind as you proceed with default judgments. Uh, okay, so you have your judgment, now you want to go about uh, collecting it. Obviously, at South Dakota, there's really two primary methods to collect. There's uh, levies on execution and garnishment. Um, there is a 30-day stay that applies anytime you take a judgment, if, uh, unless, I guess, unless the judgment was entered by default, the judgment is entered by default, there is no 30-day stay of execution, and the creditor can proceed with remedies immediately. Um, an execution is just a few general tips. Uh, the sheriffs, uh, particularly the sheriffs outside of the, of the larger cities, they're only as effective as the information you provide them. So if you have financial statements in your file, preferably signed financial statements, as Tom points out, provide that information to the uh, sheriff because it might provide opportunities for them to look at it and say, well, you know, where is the, the, the uh, Honda ATV you said you had in your financial statement? So they can go out and pick that up uh, as a potential item to collect. Um, you can search the vehicles, uh, you can search that directly through the Department of Revenue because there's a small fee to pay if you indicate the shared creditor. Uh, you're allowed to, uh, to get that information directly from them. Some sheriffs will do those searches on their own as well and then you, you save a few bucks, uh, but uh, that's, that's an option uh, that you can do on your own as well. Um, in terms of bank accounts, uh, some sheriffs take the position that they can go out and levy on bank accounts. Others take the position that that's not something they can do and you to uh, use the, the garnishment remedy. The, the argument, it's kind of an esoteric legal argument as to whether a bank account is a debt that's owed by the bank to the customer or whether it's really an asset of the customer that can be levied on uh, by the sheriff. Um, I tend to use the garnishments, particularly if the garnishment method, if uh, I don't think the sheriff's going to get out there and do it right away because the bank account is there one day and it has a balance, you want to get that garnishment paper to the bank as quickly as you can. If you, if you wait and get it to the sheriff and they have a cup of coffee and get called away on this emergency or chase that drug dealer down and then they get to it a week later, they might have even money left. So uh, that's one, one thing to think about when deciding which, uh, which methodology to use when you're looking at a bank account. Last slide on, uh, on uh, just general collections. Uh, one other remedy that you have, if your execution that you send out to the sheriff gets returned unsatisfied, you can take a debtor's examination. Uh, and I've included a little outline of a debtor's examination in the written materials. Um, under the old practice, and the, the site for this is here, the 1521, we used to uh, send our papers to the sheriff and we set the debtor's exam up in our office. Sheriff, or the, uh, uh, excuse me, send the judge. Judge would sign the order requiring the debtor to appear, serve the order personally on the debtor, and then sit with the court reporter in your office and wait for them to show up and dutifully answer regarding your property. Um, the, now the judges, uh, or at least in the last five to seven years, judges have been requiring, at least in the Second Circuit, that the judge actually be there for the debtor's exam. Initially, I thought, yeah, that's a, that's a pain. I've got to go down to the courthouse to do this. But in the end, it, it kind of helped, too, because if a, if a debtor's under oath answering questions uh, and they don't want to answer, the judge is standing there. Uh, and threaten them with a night in the cooler uh, if they don't want to answer the questions, that's helpful. Uh, if they're sitting in your office, it can be more difficult to, uh, to get that done. So, uh, then just, uh, la and I, I do think though, I do think that some of the newer judges uh, in the Second Circuit might be loosening that a little bit. They may not want to spend their time sitting and listening to debtors' exams. I know in, in courts outside of Sioux Falls, that's typically not done. You can use the court room, court room or the uh, jury room for the examination, but the judge usually doesn't want to stick around and listen to the phone. So, um, last point, that just on this one, 15669 does allow you to conduct post-judgment discovery utilizing the general rules uh, of procedure on, on third parties or otherwise to uh, find assets of the debtor. So let's move on then to, uh, to uh, foreclosures. Um, Pre foreclosure considerations, and I'm going to spend a decent amount of time talking about things you should do before you file your, your summons and complaint to commence a foreclosure action. Um, 
number one, and I think Tom kind of pointed this out, carefully review your loan documents. I remember I was at a CLE in this room many years ago. It might have even been Rick Gentwistle, and uh, one of the first comments he said was, the first thing you need to do is you need to read your loan documents. The second thing you need to do is you need to read your loan documents. And it, I, I remember that now every time I get a file and I think, okay, i got to pay attention. And sometimes, sometimes it's hard because a lot of times the, the loan docs look about the same as the other two or three files you have because creditors are all using, banks are all using the same set of forms or real similar forms that are prepared. Uh, but make sure you get your I's dotted and T's crossed up front or that your, your client did because if you, if you don't, it's easier to deal with it up front than it is after you uh, file something and make to take positions and stake out your claim in court. So I think it's, that's important. Um, I have the second point here being considered alternatives to judicial foreclosure, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that below uh, here. But I think the, uh, uh, the I want to take a little divergence here into uh, talking about Fannie Mae and some of the options that are currently available with Fannie Mae. Uh, for those that don't know, most residential mortgages in South Dakota are originated by local banks, by community banks, but sold to Fannie Mae. So Fannie Mae actually owns the loan, but your local community lender will be the one that's servicing the credit. Um, and Fannie Mae, uh, as I mentioned at the, at the beginning, I mean, their, their financial condition and the, their existence have been threatened, and they've, they've made a lot of changes and a lot of, uh, taken a lot of steps to try to recover from the mortgage crisis. Uh, and some of the things that they've done, kind of work through here, but I think the general theme is Fannie Mae doesn't want to have to foreclose on mortgages. They want to try to work with borrowers who want to pay and want to keep them in their house uh, and keep them going. They'd rather have ongoing paying assets than, than houses. Um, the first, the, so the first part I want to talk about a little bit is the HARP program. That's actually been around for a couple of years. Uh, if you listen to Sirius Radio at all, there all kinds of people have latched onto this HARP program and are advertising how it's a great deal that you can come in and get your get your home refinanced. And but the, the main the main terms of it, and if this applies, it is a, it is a good deal. Um, you you can you can finance or refinance your mortgage even if the value of your debt uh, is more than the value of your house, or the amount of your debt is more than the value of the house. And it, it allows a borrower to uh, take advantage of fall of uh, drops in rate, uh, even. You know, if they had an adjustable rate mortgage to begin with, they can get to a fixed rate mortgage, likely reduce their rate, likely change their payment. Um, they can hold the closing costs into the loan, and there's no, no appraisal required. And my last point on that, complete the paperwork. Those of you that represent debtors, I think one of the most common problems is they just they don't get the stuff done and get it back. When I talk to my servicer clients, they're mandated to go through this paperwork when people send them, uh, when people say they want to restructure, they want to refinance, and, a lot of times they'll, they'll try to do it and, and they won't even get the paperwork back. Now that may be because the people can't afford the refinance, afford the restructure, but it's, a, it's an option that's out there and something that should be considered. Uh, newer than the HARP program are two new uh, uh, Fannie Mae initiatives that have uh, come out here within the last year. One is this, a streamlined modification process. Uh, and under that process, is, this is servicer originated. In other words, the borrower doesn't have to come in and say, I want to do this. Anytime a loan goes 90 days past due, uh, the servicer sends out a modification letter to the borrower, offers the modification terms right in the letter. Um, and you can't, you, you don't have to do anything. You just have to review it, uh, sign it, and send it back if you want to uh, proceed on that basis. So it's, a, a, again, real streamlined, real quick. but requires the borrower to at least respond. Second one there is the uh, streamlined short sales. Uh, Penny Mae has become much more liberal uh, in terms of considering uh, short sales. Just so we're on the same page, short sale happens when you want to sell your house for a price that's less than the amount of the debt that you owe, and presumably you want to get out of the remaining balance of the debt, so you offer to sell it. But generally, a uh, borrower has to initiate those they're qualified based solely on the evaluation of the credit score and the loan to value on the house. There's no cost to the borrower. Um, so they're not even, they're not doing appraisals, they're not doing, uh, not requiring financial statement reporting or anything just based on your credit score. So if your borrower has a lousy credit score and paying me knows they're not able to get a deficiency from them anyway, a short sale looks like a quick opportunity for them to, uh, to get to their, uh, their asset, their house, that they're eventually be at anyway. Or as Conan O'Brien, you know, we talked about some pre-foreclosure considerations. Conan O'Brien, uh, the other night, was commenting on the uh, pre-foreclosure 
considerations made by Ace Freely. Uh, trivia question for the day is if anybody knows Ace Freely, but he was the former Kiss star. Apparently was facing foreclosure on his New York home, and in order to save money, he adopted the uh, policy that he would only rock and roll uh, for half the night and party every other day. So. <laughs> Going forward then, uh, and some of this uh, I'm sure will be reviewed for people that practice in this area and, and review loan documents, but if you look at your mortgage, there's generally two types of mortgages in South Dakota. Maybe short-term redemption mortgage, long-term redemption mortgage. Short-term redemption uh, is under 29, 21-49. My extra dash there is, uh, is off, sorry about that. That just means that you have to have, in order to qualify for a short-term redemption mortgage, the property has to be 40 acres or less. Um, and it governs uh, the provisions of 2149, govern both the provisions that can be in the mortgage and the foreclosure of, a, of that type of mortgage. SDCL 2147 sets out the provisions for long-term redemption mortgage. Uh, mortgages, those are typically ag mortgages where you have greater than 40 acres of, of, of property. And unless the creditor screws up, you rarely see a long-term redemption mortgage on anything smaller than 40 acres. Uh, and when they do, they say, oh, shucks. Because then they have to wait a whole year uh, after the foreclosure sale to get the property back. Moving on, then, you have the, the, the two types of mortgages, again, short-term redemption, long-term redemption. Either one of those can be a collateral real estate mortgage. Uh, now, SDCL 484826 sets out the requirements for a collateral real estate mortgage. And it's important to remember that when you have a cloud real estate mortgage, the balance due on the, on the debt that's secured by the mortgage can fluctuate to up and down. Typically, they're used with operating lines of credit, like with uh, farm situations or manufacturing plants where the, where the amount of the debt goes up and down seasonally based on their, their credit rates. If you get a file and it has a cloud real estate mortgage in one of the first things you want to do is see if the annual or the required five-year addendas were filed. Every five years of the collateral real estate mortgage, the creditor has to file an addendum with the uh, register of deeds, noting that the uh, mortgage is continuing and to continue the effectiveness. Um, the statute has been amended, though, such that if, even if the, if the creditor misses the addendum, they fail to file the addendum, the mortgage will still secure and remain as collateral for any indebtedness that was outstanding as of the date the mortgage lapsed. So it's not. King's X, the mortgage is lost at that point. It's only lost as to any advances after that date. Uh, so that's, that's an example of something where you really want to know what you have uh, when you go into a situation uh, in terms of whether or not your mortgage lapsed, whether or not your credit still exists, how much collateral you still have. <clears throat> so moving on then uh, further, you know, we're talking again, still talking about pre-foreclosure things you do if you have a short-term redemption mortgage. Um, the statute says that in the case of, the, in the case of default, the total debt uh, can become essentially immediately due and payable upon 20 days notice to the mortgagor. So if you have a short-term redemption mortgage, you do need to give pre-foreclosure demand. It has to be 20 days but double, uh, by statute, but double check to make sure that your note or your mortgage doesn't provide for a longer, a longer pre-foreclosure notice. I think it's important if you read the language of that statute that it's not a, a cure right. The borrower has another right just to come in and pay the past delinquencies. It's a notice of the intent to accelerate. Now, on a long-term redemption mortgage, uh, this is frustrating, but frankly, I'm not sure how who came up with our statutes, but we've got these two or three or different sets of statutes you have to look through and compare every time you want to foreclose a mortgage, so it makes it kind of complicated, and I know it took me several years to figure it out, but uh, so you get to the, the long-term redemption mortgages, there are no pre-foreclosure demand requirements there. So unlike the short-term redemption, long-term, there's no requirement. Again, read your mortgage and your note. A lot of those, a lot of note forms at least, will have some sort of a, a notice requirement in them. And it, it may be prudent to give a pre-foreclosure notice, even if it's not required. Uh, it may be an opportunity to engage in a discussion. Perhaps there's a workout, uh, as, as Tom put out, a workout that can be struck with the borrower. All those sorts of things can come into play, uh, and, uh, and sending a pre-foreclosure notice might get you there quicker. Okay, so we're proceeding along. We've uh, clicked off what kind of mortgage we have, we know what we're dealing with. One other consideration that you should think about is, is there any other collateral? Do I have any personal property collateral? Do I have the tractors? Do I have the skid loader? Um, do I need to think about those things before I commence foreclosure? Um, so, and, and if, they, if, they, if they do, personal property collateral, the first thing I advise a creditor is to say, look, can you utilize your private right of repossession? Can you get this stuff back 
without having to go about it judicially. If they can, then you get it back, liquidate the collateral, provide your proper notice of disposition, of course, uh, and then apply the net proceeds to the debt. Then commence your foreclosure after you've done that. If you can't, because the borrower's not willing to give it up or you can't utilize your private right of possession, then I suggest combining both into your foreclosure action. Uh, combining the foreclosure on the personal property and on the real estate. Um, but I think it's important in that situation uh, as you proceed with the litigation. I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit here but to tell you why to do that. Uh, it's important to do that because you will want the court to let you liquidate the personal property first, apply that to the debt, and then submit the bid at the sheriff sale for the balance of the debt that's owed after application. If you don't do that, there's risk. We'll talk about that in a, in a couple of minutes here. Example there. If you have 300,000 in debt, 50,000 in equipment, and 250 in, in real estate, again, if you combine it, get the equipment back first, liquidate the equipment, then you can proceed to your sheriff's sale safely on the, on the balance for this equipment. Um, again, continuing on the just the other collateral involved theme, um, you want to, we're going to avoid the anti deficiency statutes, which I'm going to talk about in the next slide. Uh, one other thing you can consider, in addition to the, the possibility of setting out in your complaint that you want to get the get the prop, personal property back liquidated, apply it to the debt, then proceed with your foreclosure, one other option is to combine them all together. And this works in a situation where you have uh, like a bar or restaurant where the personal property collateral, like the tables and the, the, the fryer and, and the sort of equipment like that, really don't have a value outside of what's in the uh, restaurant itself, and you think Predator thinks that they might be better you know, better off selling it all as one. In that instance, the, the provision I've cited from the UCC allows you to proceed with the sale of the personal property as if it were real property. So you combine them all when you hold a sheriff's sale, you'll be selling not only the real estate, but the, the fryer and the chairs to, as well. So why, why do we worry so much about that? Well, South Dakota has anti-deficiency statutes. Frankly, if you, if you talk to, to creditors, lawyers in other states, um, and I get calls from national lawyers that'll want to talk about this from time to time, they, I think South Dakota's anti-deficiency statutes are a little different, and so uh, they don't really understand it. But the, again, the two statutes I've cited there, the, the 49 one for the short-term redemption and the uh, Title 47 one for the uh, longer-term redemption, both of them, in this instance, require that the creditor, if, if you want to preserve a deficiency against the borrower, you have to demonstrate at the hearing uh, on the on the uh, judgment, the time of judgment center, that the fair and reasonable value of the real property is less than the amount of the debt. And also, you can also take into account any prior liens if you're foreclosing from a second position or uh, real estate taxes, etc. Uh, it's my position that if you're going to do that, you need to do it by appraisal. And you need to bring the appraiser in and have them testify to the judge, tell them what the value of the property is. I don't see how a judge could make that determination without that uh, expert testimony there to do it. Um, and then when you do that and demonstrate that, uh, hopefully if you're successful, the court will order that you be allowed to bid less than the amount of the debt. If you don't do that, though, if you don't take those steps, and you just take a judgment for the full amount of the indebtedness, my read of the statute says that you're obligated to submit a bid for the full amount of the debt at the sale. So if you do that and you haven't liquidated your personal property first, and you haven't asked the judge to let you liquidate the personal property and apply it to the proceeds, I think you've satisfied the debt at that point uh, and would be uh, would be foreclosed from going after the personal property. In that earlier example, with the three hundred thousand dollars in debt, if you just proceeded to uh, to take your judgment for the three hundred thousand and you submitted a bid at the sale for three hundred thousand, you're out. So you don't have the right to go back and get the equipment after the fact. That's how our anti-deficiency statutes work and where you need to be to be careful in your pleading. Uh, last point on this, obviously you want to plead in your complaint that you want a deficiency to place the debtor and debtor's counsel on notice that it is your intent to obtain a deficiency judgment. Of course, if you obtain the deficiency judgment at you, but after the foreclosure uh, sale, you have a deficiency against the, uh, uh, the borrower and can proceed to utilize your, uh, your remedies that we talked about on the collection action side in order to collect on that. South Dakota also has this uh, thing called the one action rule, which doesn't come up very often, but you, you see it pled in the complaint all the time, uh, both for 
for short-term redemption and long-term redemption mortgages, you do have the right uh, by statute to proceed to just sue uh, an individual on the note and not foreclose on the mortgage if you choose to do that. The only downside to doing that is after you've commenced your action on the note, if you want to go back and commence your action on the mortgage, you have to be able to demonstrate to the court that you've received a return of execution unsatisfied before you can proceed. Um, the, the only times I've seen this come up is when a, a creditor wants to put some pressure on a guarantor, for instance. If you have a solvent guarantor and you have some kind of shady real estate that you really don't want back, you may want to sue the guarantor on the debt uh, and see if you're able to get them to pay first rather than rather than going through the foreclosure and getting back this rinky-dink property that you're going to have to sell and hold and deal with. Uh, so sometimes you'll see that happen, uh, but that's about the only time the one action will really comes up. In So we're still exploring a little bit our, uh, our options. Um, 